Hey folks! After a long hiatus due to sickness, work, and holidays, I'm back with a brand new episode of Nibbles and Mouse Bites. Today, we'll be covering the jump and subroutine instructions necessary to control program flow. In total, there's only four forms of this instruction, or these instructions, and while we've been using them up until this point, they have some subtleties we haven't covered. In additionally, we'll cover interrupts and how they work on the Commodore 128. Okay, let's get into it! The first instruction we'll cover is JMP. This instruction sets the program counter directly, which causes a jump in execution. The operand can be indirect, using a vector or a pointer to another routine. In other words, the address to jump to is stored at the operand's location. For example, this JMP1300 instruction means jump to the address stored at location 1300. The JMP instruction is the only instruction that uses this indirect mode. Indirect mode has some surprising behaviors if you're not expecting it. If the pointer is stored starting at the last byte of a page, the 8502 will wrap back to the start of the page to read the second byte of the pointer. Suppose we have a pointer that crosses the page boundary by starting at 13FF and ending at 1400. If we use the indirect JMP instruction here, the 8502 will actually jump to location 4080. This is because the 8502 does not increment the page number during an indirect fetch. Instead, it will load the first byte at 13FF, increment its internal page offset by 1, and roll over to 1300 rather than 1400. In short, it's better to keep your pointers away from the end of the page. In terms of execution time, JMP is relatively quick in the absolute mode, but indirect mode takes an extra two cycles for the indirect fetch. We've implicitly covered subroutines before, but let's go over them in a little more detail. Subroutines are an easy way to break up a program into smaller, more manageable chunks, such as joystick input, animation, and sound. These chunks of code are jumped to using the JSR instruction. This is similar to JMP, but is bidirectional, and allows for returning to the point after the JSR instruction was encountered. This is because JSR implicitly pushes the return address onto the stack for later use with the RTS instruction. JSR, unlike JMP, only supports absolute addressing. Now that we know how to get into a subroutine, how do we get back? We use the RTS instruction. Think of this as an inverted JSR. It pops the return address off the stack and sets the program counter to that address. Like JSR, RTS is very simple and takes no operands. Now that we've covered subroutines, let's cover a special form of subroutine, interrupts. Fundamentally, interrupts are a way to let software handle real-time events. Essentially, interrupts trigger a jump in execution to a special kind of subroutine called an interrupt handler. They can be triggered by both hardware and software. On the Commodore 128, they're used very heavily in the ROM to handle basic functions such as sprite commands, the play command, and the advanced split-screen modes. They're also used in the monitor ROM to handle BRK instructions. Interrupts, when triggered, save a small amount of CPU state to the stack, since they can occur at any time. When a hardware interrupt is triggered, the CPU checks the interrupt flag and, if not set, pushes the program counter to the stack, pushes the status register to the stack, sets the interrupt flag, and finally jumps to the interrupt handler using the vector at FFE. When the handler is done with its work, it uses the RTI instruction to pop the status register and pop the program counter. Note that if the interrupt flag is set, only hardware interrupts are prevented. Software interrupts from the BRK instruction can still be triggered. RTI, like RTS, is very simple, boring, and takes two cycles to execute. So now that we've covered what interrupts are, let's take a look at an example. A good visual example is the raster bar technique. In our example, we'll use the raster interrupt to identify when the VIC2 has reached a specific raster line and change the color of the border and background at that point. When we reach the last raster line in our bar, we'll change the color back, 
before we get into the code, we should talk about how the 128's interrupts work. When a hardware interrupt fires, the 8502 jumps to the address in FFFE. This points to a location in 17FF in the ROM. This routine determines the cause of the interrupt and then branches to a more specific interrupt handler vector. The vector we'll override is the raster interrupt vector at 0314, which is triggered by the VIC2. Normally, this vector points to 65FA, and it handles interrupts for other functions of the system as well. To alter it, we have to wedge our handler in place by changing the vector. Complete the wedge and allow the system to operate normally, our routine must call the original handler when we're done. Let's look at this technique in a bit more detail. Essentially, we have to insert our routine in the middle of the normal execution path by using another vector. Our custom routine lives at 1400 hex, but before we can use it, we have to swap out the ROM handler for ours in the init routine. First, we save the interrupt vector to a temporary vector at 00FD. Next, we set the address of our custom handler in the interrupt vector at 0314. Since our routine calls the original using the JMP indirect instruction, we've effectively wedged in our handler just before the original can run. Okay, with that in mind, let's get to the code. The first block is our initialization code, which might seem a little strange since it ends in an RTS instruction. We'll see why in a few moments. Before we can swap the raster IRQ vector around, we must disable interrupts by setting the interrupt flag. This ensures that if the VIC triggers an interrupt in the middle of the vector change, we don't accidentally jump to an undefined location. With the interrupt flag set, we can then save the existing vector to location 00FD. We don't have to use 0Page, but it's faster to do so. These next two instructions clear the configuration register for CIA number 1. Effectively, this disables all interrupts and timers coming from the CIA. This is not required, and is left over from debugging. Now that our code has been wedged in, we can turn on raster interrupts by setting bit 0 in the VIC interrupt mask register. We then read the interrupt flag register to acknowledge any currently firing interrupts to prevent spurious interrupts from occurring later. We clear the ninth bit of the raster compare register, which is actually bit 15 in D011. Next, we set the raster compare register to fire the interrupt at line 252. Finally, we clear the interrupt flag to let interrupts fire again, and return back to the monitor. The second half of our program is the interrupt routine at 1400 hex. The first thing our interrupt does is set the colors that we want for the beginning of the raster bar. We then enter a very short iteration loop to let time pass just enough to extend the length of the line. This isn't 100% ideal, but it keeps things simple. Next, we set the colors to our background color again, and acknowledge the IRQ from the VIC with an ASL instruction. The act of reading from this register automatically clears it in the VIC, so this should be an LDA instruction instead of an ASL, as ASL takes 6 cycles to execute. After that, we increment our border start position by 1 and store it into the raster compare register to trigger the next interrupt at the next scan line. Finally, we trigger an indirect jump to the ROM's interrupt handler through the vector we saved earlier. Okay, let's try this out. Note that the raster bar keeps running in the quote-unquote background because the interrupt fires from the VIC and triggers our handler, but the rest of the ROMs keep running. Don't be fooled though, this is an illusion. Because the CPU executes faster than the time it takes to draw the screen, we don't see any slowdown. If we overload our interrupt with additional work, the CPU will have less time to run other code. This was a quick overview of how to use the Commodore 128's interrupt handlers as well as the jump and subroutine instructions. It wasn't meant to be comprehensive, since I'll leave that to the next Nibbles and Bytes video, but it should give you an idea of how they work. Something I'd like to mention about my posting frequency 
Unfortunately, I'm preparing to travel to Taiwan in the coming weeks to help bring up some boards that I've been working on for work. This may knock me out for a couple of two weeks, but when I get back, I fully plan on getting back into the bi-weekly video schedule. Now before I go, I'd like to give a shout out to my latest patrons. Joe, Weilowe, James Burgo, Udo, and Ian. Thank you all so much. Okay, that about wraps it up for this video. See you in the next one.